All right, so today uh, we have Tommy and Joseph, and they're going to be talking to you about OpenStack access control for a private cloud. Um, I'm sure they've worked extremely hard on this project, so if you guys could give them your full attention, I'd really appreciate it, and uh, good luck. Thank you. All right, so uh, as you said, here at JMU, we've had the wonderful opportunity to use a lot of the JMU computing resources. However, we did notice there are a couple things that do not make it the ideal situation. Uh, for instance, the first thing being that uh, it's really expensive to buy your own personal laptop or computer. They can cost upwards of around $600, and the programs that you buy might not even be able to run on the operating system you choose. So for instance, if you buy a uh, MacBook, you can't run Windows programs, and this could be a big problem when uh, trying to run programs for your certain major or your uh, uh, and then the second thing we notice is that uh, JMU Lab Labs house programs specific for students majors and so the, um, these labs are not always open all the time meaning that um, that students who often work or have a part-time job and need to use these resources in these labs would not be able to do so if these lab times uh, coincide with the job times and therefore uh, it would be ideal if labs were always open, but we can. this is not the case. And then finally, um, one of JMU's solutions to this would be to implement vSphere, vSphere, which is a cloud computing proprietary system. However, the licensing fees for this are extremely expensive, and so this is, again, is not the ideal solution. So what is OpenStack? That brings us to our project. Uh, OpenStack is essentially a set of software tools allowing you to create and manage your own public and private cloud. Uh, the key being that OpenStack is an open source uh, cloud, which means anyone can use it, and if they have the necessary hardware, as well as many big companies have their own uh, cloud system, such as Amazon Web Services, which you may have heard of, or Microsoft Cloud Azure. Uh, but the b big feature with OpenStack is that it's open source, which means that the big software companies are backing it and constantly updating it and making it better and better uh, and adding on to it. OpenStack is also an implementation of what's called an infrastructure as a service, which means it manages compute networks and storage resources for users to be able to customize in any way they choose. So uh, right now we're gonna show you a little demo of one implementation that we've uh, customized OpenStack to be right now, which is uh, desktop as a service infrastructure. So right now Tommy's gonna go and spawn a VM. So right here you can see that we're logging into the uh, default dashboard page and basically uh, each page has their own like domain you would log in and under that you have your projects, your groups, your roles, and your um, users and so within each one uh, you can kind of think of it as a hierarchy uh, as one falls under the other. Uh, so right now he's going to spawn an instance and the key here, he's actually going to spawn three instances and the awesome thing about this is the scalability of OpenStack. So OpenStack you can use it to uh, spawn as many instances as you like as long as you have the hardware and computing resources for it. And this means that it, let's say you work in a big data center and you need a lot of uh, processes run, you could easily just spawn a bunch of smaller uh, computers to run these processes for you. Uh, so as you see here, he's spawning three right now and they should come up in a, in a little bit, they're very quick. So while he lets that spawn, I'm going to talk to you. Um, so this would be more for like servers, so these aren't really as exciting to show, but uh, for the students, we would want to use something like a Windows desktop. So as you can see, they spawned right away, they're running. And so now he's going to show you the console for a uh, Windows desktop that a student would access. And hopefully it comes up. Uh, it's just, yeah, there you go, it's a little load. So it's exactly like what you'd see on your regular uh, desktop, except it's all run through the cloud, which means it's all run through computing resources that you access through a web browser. Um, so finally, next, I'm going to go over the hierarchy of what OpenStack sort of does and what each component is. Uh, so as we saw uh, Tommy do, he spawned an instance using the compute service, and what that did is it used the, cer the hardware and resources of that compute, which is basically a computer, and then looked toward the image service, which then uh, pulled the image he wanted to spawn. Uh, we saw this through the dashboard as he logged into it, and that sort of gives you like an overall like hierarchy of uh, all the stuff you have access to. Uh, the instance then gets uh, connectivity to the internet through the networking service, 
And all of this is then run through the uh, key component being the identity service. And this identity service is crucial because it provides authentication and authorization for each uh, one of these features. And without it, uh, none of uh, these services would be able to run together or be authenticated. Uh, so this is where we needed to focus most of our attention on is being able to <coughs> secure that identity service in order to give users uh, access to it in a, a beneficial way. So previous implementation, last year a group of students did a study sort of as a, a test proof of concept where uh, using OpStack they were given several recommendations to us to improve upon what we could do in order to make it more proprietary and make it more accessible for an educational environment. And so the first was access control which means that users, uh, basically policies put in place that tell users what they are and are not allowed to do. And the second is integration with pre-existing databases. So you can think of that as like uh, MySQL database or uh, what you would log on to using your JMU EID and password. And uh, these two features really help uh, bring the project together. So we had two cases then to address if we wanted to OpenStack to be a feasible solution to these issues. So one, it obviously wouldn't be feasible to create a single account using OpenStack uh, for each user, as you saw Tommy log in with that admin user, uh, in order for each user to have their own access to virtual machines that they'd be able to provision, uh, we'd have to create an account for every single user and this simply is uh, not possible as it would simply be too much time to create uh, one for every single person at JMU with, when we have over 21,000 students. Um, it would also be almost impossible to determine how many resources they're using at a time, so they would be able to um, basically have free run and they might be using too much hardware or too much uh, pressure on the system. And so we would need to be able to monitor that and uh, give them specific uh, access to those services. And then second, we had to make sure that each student could only access the VM that they are entitled to. And what that means is at the current moment, if uh, Tommy were to log in, like we went to the Windows instance, log in and use that instance, and someone else, let's say, wanted to use the instance as well, they would log in, they would both be fighting for the same instance meaning that uh, the mouse basically would be like battling between which user to use. And so uh, the way we would want to use it is to allow one user uh, to only have access to that instance and then another user to have access to a different instance where it would be personalized for them. So in addressing, addressing these challenges, we have come up with a few uh, solutions. Uh, the first solution is to integrate Active Directory with OpenStack. Um, this solves the problem of having to manually enter um, each user into OpenStack's database. Um, all the users would be directly um, filled in from the Active Directory uh, domain. Um, and the other would be how we want to implement access control for resource allocation. So we have two cases with that. The first case is um, letting the teachers or admin access OpenStack in which they have um, more resources, say like 50 gigabytes, in which they then assign their students um, virtual machines. And these students would have policies implemented on these virtual machines, um, disallowing them to uh, create or delete the virtual machines. They could only view the virtual machines in which their teachers assigned. Um, the second case is where each student actually gets their own access to um, all these instances and they can cre create or delete um, their virtual machines as their heart desires. However, they would have a, smar a smaller resource allocation for this. Um, an example of this would be if a student is given 10 gigabytes, they could probably only create one Windows, one Windows server and maybe one Ubuntu server, whereas um, if they didn't want to create a Windows, they could create maybe like 10 Ubuntu servers. So it's all, it's up to them. It provides them more flexibility for what they want to do. Um, so what is Active Directory? Active Directory is a directory database that keeps track of all the user accounts and passwords within an organization. It provides authorization and authentications for users, computers, groups, and I say objects as in anything that has an ID that can be tagged to it, really. Um, and also, it also provides access control through policies, which I will show you an example here in a minute. But another important aspect of Active Directory is um, why it's actually called Active Directory Domain Services is the fact that it has the ability to create domains. 
Um, when you go to a website like google.com or jmu.edu, these are all different domains and each, each user account is linked, is referenced to these domains. Um, a domain also can act as a DNS server, which its job is to translate the website into an IP address, which you can see here. Um, and I'll show you a quick example uh, showing access control with an Active Directory. So here you can see a bunch of different users. Um, these users are only on the Active Directory server and not local to the machine. And I will show you two different scenarios. So the first scenario is going to show is basically, uh, let's say a teacher having access to a trash can and task manager. And then the second would be where a student wouldn't be able to access the trash can or task manager. So this teacher account is not local to the computer at all. It's on the Active Directory domain and you saw me sign in. Um, and you notice I can do just about anything because I have not enforced the policy on it. So for example, I can open Task Manager. And um, since the policy I created deals with um, being able to see the recycle bin, um, just note right now that you can actually see the recycle bin. Um, so that would be an example teacher account with no policies on it or like an administrator. And so this is another user, which you can see is user one is one of the users we created. And I'll sign in with this one. And right away you can notice that I can't in fact see the recycle bin and I don't have access to task manager. Uh, if I were to type in task manager here, you would see that it has been disabled by your administrator. So that's kind of how Active Directory works uh, through policies. Um, so now that you know a little bit about Active Directory, I can now talk about integrating OpenStack with Active Directory. Um, there are two key aspects into integration. And the first one is the Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. As it says in its name, it's a lightweight protocol designed to quickly look up database information. Um, and, the main per and the main protocol supported by Active Directory is um, LDAP. So in order to be able to integrate OpenStack with Active Directory, it was crucial that um, OpenStack supported LDAP connections. Um, and the other big thing is um, describing what Keystone is. Keystone is OpenStack's identity service. Um, you can kind of think of it like um, OpenStack's version of Active Directory and the fact that it provides authorization, authentication, and access control. Uh, but the most important thing about Keystone is that it supports multiple backends, and this means that it can be integrated with other authentication systems like Active Directory. Um, and the beauty of it being a backend means that we don't have to um, say either use only Active Directory or only um, Keystone for authentication and access control. We can actually mix and, mix and match. Uh, for example, in my project that I did, I'm only using Active Directory to pull the users and authenticate, and all the policies are actually enforced within Keystone itself. Um, here's just a image trying to uh, say that a little better. Uh, the controller is the computer that we're running all the OpenStack software on and the OpenStack consists of multiple different services like the network, the compute, the image. We're obviously focused on the Keystone. Within Keystone you have uh, multiple different services and backends like the projects, roles, tokens, endpoint policies. Um, but the identity one is important because those modules, uh, you can see the modules support LDAP and SQL. And you can see that LDAP pool it <coughs> provides authentication from Active Directory and also lists the identities, the usernames and all that. Um, but it has another function of DNS for name resolution and like that shows, it changes, it um, relates the website name to an IP address. Um, and I'll show you an example of this uh, now. So let's go back to Let's go back to these users. Um, I will pull these users from the Active Directory into OpenStack. So if 
first, let's, I SSH'd into the controller computer. Spell it open stack, user, open stack. So as you can see, it lists all these different users um, that reside on the Active Directory. Um, uh, just to show, I can add another user and have it show up. So let's call him Tom, and let's make the username Tom. And let's just make the password. All right, so as you can see, I added a username Tom. Um, you're going to notice initially it doesn't add it to the list, so you will not see Tom in this because I have to, when I'm doing these, this LDAP search, I specify the exact folder in which I wanted to um, bring up the results. And since Active Directory is so big, um, you don't want to typically search every single user in the entire Active Directory. That's that just doesn't make much sense and you will never find what you're looking for. Um, so only after I add it to the correct group in which it is searching for will it show up. So I made an example group called OpenStack. So now if I go like this again, you will see Tom listed down below. Um, so that's kind of how LDAP works, and I'll show you a better example to wrap your head around um, what we can do with actually integrating OpenStack with Active Directory. So you notice right here, there's a domain field, and before I, before we did the integration, um, it was just username and password because obviously every every uh, user was local to the OpenStack database. Um, but now there's the domain field in which we have to specify the domain. Um, so first I'm going to try to log in with Tom, the newly created user. And you're going to see... So you're, you're going to see that you are not authorized for any projects or domains. So just because we have created the user and it's pooling it, um, Active Directory only provides the authentication and does not provide the access control. So I have to actually um, create a role for um, Tom to use the project. So I'm going to log in with, uh, say, a teacher, which I created. Um, he was already part of a project and actually has admin privileges. So as you can see, I can log in um, and do everything that an admin can. Uh, I can also go, I can also edit the project now that I'm an admin to manage members. And I see Tom over here, so I'm going to add Tom to this project. Click Save. So now if I go back, sign out with Tom, I should now be able be allowed to log in if I can type correctly. As you can see, I can now log into the instance. So that's just a quick example. Um, so this slide is to give you a little more information on how LDAP works. First, it has to authenticate, and once it authenticates, then it provides authorization. So when a, when a user tries to perform an LDAP query, it first has to authenticate with um, the, the Active Directory server with the username and password that's located within it. And if it's, if it's successful, it'll send a success response, and then um, the user can perform a request for whatever uh, information he's trying to receive, whether it be like an ID or an email or um, anything like that. Um, 
once the server receives this request, it then has to um, say whether or not the user is actually allowed to see what he's trying to see. And if he is, then it will um, give him the results and show him the information that he's looking up. Um, these are two Wireshark captures showing uh, successful um, binding, the same thing as authenticating essentially, and so he's successful and then he makes the request and the LDAP server returns the request and you can see um, this is a user and it goes on and on, these are users as well, but it's cut off. Um, and this is the case where um, it actually failed and it wasn't successful authenticating and so um, clearly you see you don't get these two packets. So the last thing um, to talk about is resource <coughs> allocation, and there's not much to say other than to provide a good demo demonstrating this. And so I will do that now. Um, so basically, OpenStack uh, implements policies that basically allow users to access, or tell users or admins what they can and cannot do. And so with this demo, we're gonna show you like how to apply a policy on a user. And so as Tommy's logging in, he's logging in with a uh, username teacher and like a teacher's password. And so he's going to apply a policy on, let's say a student, um, that that student would not be able to spawn more than one VM. So since I'm an admin, I can actually edit the project and edit all these different things. And as you can see, all these different things. So right now this project is allowed to create 10 instances and we can control that to as much as we want. You can also see how much RAM they're allowed to use and um, all these other different rules, subnets, routers, ports, um, and all that. So let's go, let's, let's change this to one to only allow anyone in that um, project to create one instance altogether. So quick save. Since I added Tom to this project, I can now sign in as Tom and uh, show you that. So as you can see, we already since we already have an instance running, I can't actually launch an instance that says quota exceed, exceeded. Um, so that essentially shows that. So again, that's just showing applying a policy to a user from an admin perspective. All right, so um, our project obviously focused on access control, but we feel like in order to uh, better the project and to increase usability for future uh, educational purposes. There are several recommendations that we want to recommend for students who are looking to further this project. Uh, the first would be to use a BDI broker to better enforce policies as well as to allow better access uh, for users to access VMs. Um, so basically, well my, my job at the project that I unfortunately was unable to, unable to get working was to use a VDI connection broker in order to create a pool of instances that a user would then be able to access and then through his authentication server would be authenticated to access uh, the certain VMs that were created by the pool and the broker would then assign that um, user the instance that we could uh, specify. Um, the next thing we recommend is user-friendly resource pass-through. So right now, unfortunately, OpenStack does not implement a friendly way in order for a user to be able to plug in a USB drive or another piece of hardware to their computer that would directly interact with the interface in order to use it in the uh, cloud environment. And so we would want to further pursue uh, a way to do this in order for users to be able to have more storage per se than just the VM's regular amount of storage that they'd be allocated, uh, as well as to be able to use other features that a user would want to. And then um, another recommendation would be OpenStack containers, or what's called part of the Magnum service. So containers are basically a lightweight kernel that runs uh, basically a application or program uh, that's self-contained. And so with this, you could run um, a bunch of services and be able to basically create as many services as your heart desires uh, that would just benefit uh, other people as a whole because uh, with these services, they allow, other, they allow people to uh, basically use uh, something as a standalone product rather than attaching it to a 
hardware interface. And finally, we want to create scripts for customized policies. So as we explained earlier in the policy section, OpenStack does have a list of already preset policies. However, as you can see here, however, uh, these uh, by using customizable policies, you would be able to essentially allow for more access control uh, within the OpenStack environment if the VDI connection broker uh, essentially is not a viable option. So in conclusion, uh, obviously our project focused on uh, why access control is crucial for administration, especially administration in the cloud. We saw that obviously you would want to control the, what users have access and what resources you would want these users to use, as well as uh, what resources you would want teachers to use and be able to assign to their users or students. Um, but that wasn't the only thing we gained from this experience. Uh, all in all, it was truly a learning experience from top to bottom. Uh, going into this project, uh, Tommy and I had no idea what a cloud was. We had no idea what OpenStack was or any of the services. We had to learn all of that uh, from the ground up, as well as uh, learning troubleshooting skills. Uh, so whether it was uh, parsing through a log file at 2 a.m. in the morning to figure out an error, or uh, just going back through every little detail of every little file and figuring out, oh, I need a space here to fix the issue. Uh, it definitely was a unique experience that cost a lot of time, uh, but was definitely rewarding in the end. And finally, just the proficiency with the Linux operating system that we are running our OpenStack Cloud on. Uh, by learning all the commands, we are becoming way more familiar, and Linux is uh, often used in the IT world because it's such a lightweight and easy to use infrastructure. Um, and in addition to our project, we also had additional challenges that we were faced with. So uh, we didn't just focus on access control uh, the whole time. We had a, a bunch of other little projects that we would try to do. Um, each week that we would ultimately learn something new and gain another experience out of it. So uh, we would learn Samba 4, which is another version of Active Directory, but uh, an open source version of it that runs cross-platform and can actually uh, manage users on both Linux and Windows environments. And then USB over IP, we actually learned that there's a tool where you can actually send the information in your uh, drive over the internet where you can access it from another port on the other side um, of let's say like a WAN interface. Um, and the most important thing we learned was that time does not always equal progress. You could spend five days uh, troubleshooting the same issue over and over again or you could uh, figure it out in five minutes and you'd get the same um, amount of progress. Uh, but over all in all, each by like looking through these errors and by going through each thing, you ultimately gain a better fundamental knowledge of the uh, infrastructure as a whole as well as things that you would not uh, think would be important to you and therefore uh, it's uh, it added to the uh, overall great learning experience. Cool. Um, so we would like to thank Safa for providing the necessary equipment we need at all times. I can't see him right now but um, he's, hiding. he's hiding. But his li uh, Dr. Sleep's life would be a nightmare if he had to deal with all the equipment and the computers every single day, as well as all the requests students ask for equipment. So that was a lot. So thank you, Safa. And obviously, we want to thank Dr. Sleep for his guidance and support, as well as challenging us throughout the year. Um, Lord knows we tested his patience, but uh, he's been with us this whole time. And he's one of the few teachers that um, would actually take hours out of his day to help us troubleshoot the problem. So thank you, Dr. Sleep. Then, of course, we'd like to thank our friends and families for your support and motivation throughout this project. Any questions? Questions? No questions. See, there's a design. No one would ask any questions. <laughs> <laughs> All by design. It's been a a quite uh, a remarkable journey within this particular project. I, I am I, I did, I, uh, I'm speechless because until yesterday night we were still uh, actually working on few things that we were hoping to make the project even a lot more glorious. Uh, however, actually at the end of the day we found what it is that we're supposed to be able to do. So although as as Dodd may mention, there was one click there that is 
Um, not complete, but I think we are on the right track, and I'm very proud of what Tommy accomplished and Dodd accomplished. So uh, it's a wonderful job. <laughs> Now it's time for pictures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>